Welcome to the True Face Podcast. My name is Robbie Angle, and I'll be your guide as we have conversations about what we can learn from what's going on in our lives. Most of us get stuck in our relationships with God and others, and we end up wondering, is this really all there is to it? Here's a question. What if God isn't who you think he is and neither are you? The grace-based relational discipleship resources at trueface.org help you answer that, to help you live into your true identity. And our hope is that this conversation will help you do that. So whether you're watching this on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, please remember to subscribe, share, and join our growing tribe of Jesus followers by going to trueface.org. And for some of you who have been listening, a lot of you have downloaded our app, True Face Life app. Go to the App Store or wherever Android people go to get their apps. I love you. No judgment there. I just got sucked into the machine, so it's easier to stay there of Apple. So uh, True Face Life is the app. It's got our small group studies. It's got our True Face conversations for you to do with one other person. It's got how to launch a True Face journey in your church or to launch a group yourself. We have a ton of our resources. We even have our daily devotional on the app every day for you. So check out True Face Life app uh, on, on the App Store. So this episode of this True Face podcast, I'm super excited. I get to introduce you to a relatively new friend of mine over the past year. Her name is Carolyn Takeda. Do I say your last name right? Uh, it's Takeda. Takeda! I, I knew <laughs> I was wrong. So Carolyn is a certified leadership coach. She helps people move from where they are to where they want to be. She's got 30 plus years of, of leadership experience. She was a small groups pastor, executive director, writer, podcast host. And prior to all that, she was a litigation attorney. Uh, she, she does a lot of coaching now with leaders and teaches workshops, um, helps them grow in their emotional intelligence skills. It, she works a lot with women and issues in their leadership, not women's issues, but women. <laughs> Issues related. I'll be careful to there, Robbie. That's right. <laughs> and, and helping people navigate life transitions. Um, and so feel free to check her stuff out. Carolyn Takeda. Takeda. <laughs> I, uh, man, you just told me and I already messed it up, Carolyn. I'm no sorry. Takeda. C A R O L Y N T A K E T A dot com. And you can email her, find her there, uh, check her out. Carolyn Takeda, how are you? And welcome to the True Face Podcast. Oh, Ravi, it's such a joy to be here with you. And yes, the last name is hard. My husband is Japanese American. He's third and fourth generation. I'm actually Korean. My original last name was O, which had been really easy. <laughs> yeah, way easier. Um, but it's such a joy to be here with you. And I know when we met back last fall, it was like we were together for about 10 minutes and we're like, okay, how, how we're like soul brother and sister. So it's such a joy to be back with you on your uh, program. We got to spend a, uh, we, a couple, uh, some quantity time together mm -hmm. last year and some partnership overlap stuff about groups and discipleship. And yeah, you're right. It, it, is, it was so refreshing because you just get it. And you've been in the leadership roles of how to move the needle and think differently about how God's designed us to grow through the context of relationships and how that's hard in bigger churches. And <laughs> yeah, I agree. It was uh it was symbiotic in a lot of ways of our thinking and our passion. And as you're becoming a friend, it was fun because you also got to meet Bruce. Got to get some time with Bruce. Okay. I, I just have to confess. I am such a fangirl of Bruce. And I didn't know anything about True Face. I didn't know anything about Bruce. I had not read The Cure. And um, Robbie promptly purchased it for me at full price, I must say. So gracious at the conference. And I read it on my flight back. And it was um, so remarkable. But I did get to meet Bruce. And he is amazing treasure. He is. He, he, is, a, he is a stud. Uh, so, Carolyn, we were talking uh, a, a month ago. And I was like, I got to get you on the podcast. Mm -hmm. We talked about about a, a half a dozen things that I'd love to pick your brain on. And we can have you back, Carolyn. But <laughs> this one, we were, we were talking about some, your journey a lot as you're in another transition. Um, but catch us up on the, your journey, what you've been learning, and yeah, that you'd like to share with us today. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Ravi. Yeah, there's so many things. Um, when you told me you can pick a principle that has been trans transformative in your life and your walk with Jesus and share that. And then you were like, whatever, whatever it is, so much freedom. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's like 20 million things that God has taught me over the years. Um, but as I prayed and thought through, um, especially in the context of this new tribe that I, I love and I want to be part of, um, that the one that kind of kept rising to the surface is this quote um, that I heard years and years ago uh, from Dallas Willard. And it's basically, I'm paraphrasing it, but it's that God is more interested in who we are becoming than what we are doing in ministry. And I think, um, and I'll talk about why this was so impactful, but to understand why it's impactful, you have to understand kind of where I came from. So as I mentioned, um, I grew up uh, in churches that were really legalistic. I grew up in immigrant Korean churches, actually, and I'm a 1.5 generation Im Korean immigrant, which means that we came over when I was seven years old, which is why there's the 0.5, because I came over so young, so I'm highly Americanized, and yet uh, my family of origin has deep values that are Korean, um, and a lot of that is around achieving, around respect, uh, valuing authority, and serving. Um, so deeply embedded into me was the need to serve and be of service to others, which is a good thing. So there's a lot of these things are really good things. But then you know how sin gets mixed in in our ear, ego and pride and fear and insecurity gets all jumbled up. And so this is how it showed up in my life with God. So I have kind of the whole family of origin stuff, which is all about doing and achieving. And then I have grew up in legalistic churches um, that were very focused on giving implicit and explicit messages about, you know, how, I don't know, Ravi, you may be too young to remember these songs about, you know, the warm that we are and how unworthy we are and yet how God loves us. True, but there was just a lot of emphasis on how unworthy we were. Um, and the only way we can make ourselves worthy was by doing stuff for God. And that kind of was the kind of the heart, the beat. I think that my uh, formation in life with God was really wrapped around the for God rather than the with God as um, the transition in that that quote um, talks about. And Robbie, recently I listened to your podcast um, and you had an episode about spiritual formation and you actually talked about the with God life versus the for God life. So that's kind of a good little handle that will go through, I think, our conversation. So now you have, so I have three things going against me on the, the living um, with God versus for God. So I have my kind of family of origin, Korean American culture. Then I have these legalistic churches that keep uh, making me feel unworthy unless I do stuff for God. And then I have a personality and I am a one on the Enneagram, which for those of you who may not be familiar with this personality typing tool, um, that they will label the one as the reformer and the perfectionist. So then you lay that on top and I am a recovering perfectionist. Um, so I have deep in me in my temperament, just a need to prove myself. Um, and a high level of criticalness about whether um, I measure up to myself, my standards, um, which are, are too high as a perfectionist. And so I think also part of my personality with that is the need to stay in control and wanting to stay in control um, and the chaos of a life as an immigrant and moving around every couple of years. There's a lot of things that you know you just try to control as a child and as an adult. Um, so I think there's just kind of a perfect storm of a number of things that really sent the message to me that, yeah, God loves me. Yeah, 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 I get that. I've been a Christian my whole life. My parents are extremely devoted to Jesus. Church, we spent more time in church than anywhere else. Um, and so I got a lot of good things out of that, um, a deep love for scripture and understanding of all that. But also with it came this idea that I'm only worthy if I do for God. Mm. Um, and though he loves me, I think I kind of had a picture of God as um, like he loves me, but he's mildly disappointed at best and really disappointed, you know, at worst um, when he sees me. I, I couldn't relate to songs or verses like, you know, that he delights over me, that he sings, rejoices over me, that I'm this precious, beloved child. Like intellectually, I might have gotten it, but I certainly didn't get it in my heart um, until I actually became a parent. I have two daughters, and as I became a parent, and I, um, I was a lawyer, then a stay-at-home mom, and during that stay-at-home mom stage, when they were little, 
I just start to really understand, oh my gosh, if I, in my limited human sinful self, can love my child this much, and there's like nothing I wouldn't do for this child, um, and sacrifice doesn't even feel like sacrifice for her, then I'm like, how much more could God love me? Like it started to tangibly experience it. Mm. Um, so motherhood became a really great laboratory for me to start understanding the love of God and what that would look like. And it wasn't, and this baby, right? You know, you, you're a parent of eight children, which is remarkable and incredible. Um, so you're eight times more spiritual than I could ever be, but it's, just, it kind just of four showed, time, just to help your math there. Just to help. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're right, but you're that much better. So I just, you know, gave you exponential growth right there. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I kept thinking this baby does nothing for me. I mean, it's just basically all this baby is, is a drain for my resources and my time, energy, all the things. And yet um, this baby needs to do absolutely nothing to be beloved and cherished and all the things. So I think that's kind of when the the needle started. And around then I started reading um, Dallas Willard. I started reading and kind of educating myself beyond kind of the faith that I grew up with, beyond the doing faith. I started to understand grace. I remember reading Yancey's book when I was in law school, um, What's So Amazing About Grace. And that was life changing. I, I had never thought about Grace that way. And Philip Yancey, um, he recently last year had a book with his biography and it made so much sense because I thought my churches were legalistic growing up. His were like, oh my gosh, serious, serious, hardcore restrictive. Um, and I, it just made so much sense why so much of his writings really spoke to me. Um, so I started reading, started learning, started experimenting and doing less and seeing, is God going to like smite me now? And realizing, no, there was just more love. There was just more grace. Um, and then as I moved from um, practicing law to being staying home and then to ministry, and that's a story for another time, um, and I stepped into the church we were, we were attending, first as a part-time small groups director, and then a few years later as my kids got older and had more time, then I became a, a licensed pastor there and started taking a lot more ownership over much more um, areas. And as my leadership responsibilities grew, um, I found that I was starting to lean on this um, doing stuff again. And by God's grace, he connected me with a uh, with Jan Johnson who, as my spiritual director. And for um, decades, she taught with Dallas Willard at Fuller and other places. And I've been with her now um, for almost, gosh, 14 years, I think. Wow. Um, and I was in vocational ministry 17 years until I stepped down in the end of 2022. So I think during the journey with her and her understanding and her input in my life and her paying attention to those voices in me when I started to, to pipe up with the doings and mm -hmm. just wanted to justify my worthiness and my existence. Like she was so great because she could see it and call it out. I think sometimes us in the church and vocational ministry, it's almost tougher because what we're doing is ministry. So we feel like, okay, I should get lots of points for this, but to preserve our soul and to continue a life with God that's intimate and that's transparent, apart from our activity is almost tougher, I think, when you're on staff. And I'd love to get your input on this later, um, Robbie, but I found it more challenging than when I was a lawyer. There the lines were clear, maybe because in the in the darkness, a little candle can shine, but in ministry, there's it, it was expected. So I found myself kind of stepping back into it and I thought, oh, I thought I'd gotten so far from this, but you know, it's right there. This is kind of probably a, a thing I'll probably wrestle with. I think most of my life, it'll pop up every so often. I see it popping up again when I can uh, transition from um, pastoral ministry and on being on staff at this large church and all the things that come with that to starting my own business um, as myself and coaching leaders and having to do business development, all the things, I saw it all pop up again. I remember talking to my spiritual director saying, I thought I was over this. I get that, you know, God, it, God loves me no matter what, none of this. I don't have to earn any of it. Um, and he cares more about my character. I get this, but then why am I back? fighting these insecurities again. And I think it's because um, we, they're almost, you know, I think you and I talked about this last fall, it's almost a spiral, right? Like we deal with similar things, but now at a different level. So I feel like as I progress, and now in my mid fifties, this steam continues to um, be sharpened. And I understand more um, each time as I go into different experiences. So 
I think this whole idea, and as, as I was listening to Robbie's podcast, I was like, oh no, this is exactly what I'm talking about on the spiritual formation one. So if you haven't heard it, I really encourage you to go back and listen. He talks about this mountain analogy, which is um, so apt. And he talks about the climbing. Um, I say he as if you're not here, Robbie. But you talk about the climbing and how exhausting it is to keep trying and trying. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if you saw, you must have seen, you might have been too young, Robbie, to see the movie um, Saving Private Ryan. Oh, yeah. Uh, he it. did too. Okay, 25 years ago. So my husband really likes history, um, World War I, too. So he watched this movie, and I can still remember watching this movie two decades ago, um, not to be a spoiler alert, because if you haven't seen this movie, you're probably not going to, so yeah. it's okay. All right, so, at the end of the, so the whole point of it, and I'll just share it really briefly, but this whole movie it, with Tom Hanks and... Um, Oh, and my other, what's his name? Uh, Matt Damon, young Matt Damon. So it's this whole movie about this Captain Miller, which is Tom Hanks. He leads a group of men to rescue Private Ryan, who is serving in a battalion in France, because they want to return him home to his parents, because three of his brothers have already died in the war, and they can't have a fourth Ryan die. So it's Miller and this whole group of people, and they're not super happy about it. They go through it. And a number of them are killed along the way. And at the very end, you see this captain, uh, Miller, who led the charge to find this guy. And they go through all two hours of stuff to get to this guy. And you see that he um, he's going to die. He's fatally shot. And then he tells Ryan, he leans really close, and he says, earn this. Earn it. Mm. Um, and then at the very end, um, gosh, I can't believe this so, this. Um, as you can see from my voice, it still impacts me. So at the very end, Ryan now, you know, he's a grandfather. So you see this old um, person goes to the gravesite with his whole family, his grandkids, everyone, to Miller's gravesite. And he asks, he tells him, he has this private moment and he says, um, I tried to do my best throughout my life to earn the sacrifice you made. And I hope it was enough. And I think, I think most of my life I've spent... Um, the first half, the first half of the mountain life um, was spent probably till about 25. I think it cuts pretty evenly um, was spent trying to um, hope that it was enough for God to find me worthy for uh, my fam my parents, for church people, for whatever. And for myself to feel like it was enough. And then the second part on the plateau, having this recognition on a much more deeper level. And when I first saw that movie, I remember crying because it is kind of a tearjerker. So you probably are going to cry, but I just was really hit with this is it. This, this is what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so see, God can use anything. He can use line of movie, but it just, and I was, I turned to the people um, I was with and I said, do you guys catch that? Like, this is Jesus, like right here, him saying, you know, this is the opposite of what he did on the cross. And, mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think it struck everybody else quite the same as it struck me, but it was such a poignant thing. And I think that transition um, has made all the difference. So now let me just finish up by saying on, when you do see, and I think the last 25 years has been about understanding and living into this life with God. And obviously some slippage along the way, slipping down the mountain a bit, trying to re-earn it, coming back. And Dallas Willard says, you know, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Um, and at being effortful, pursuing, that is a beautiful thing. And that is a needed thing. Mm -hmm. But when it's attached to our worthiness and our earning, it is a very toxic, toxic thing. And unfortunately, a lot of churches... Um, I think kind of feed off of it, maybe consciously, unconsciously, um, and a lot of church systems feed off of it. And I think in my years in ministry, I tried really hard to con to develop curriculum to shepherd people away from the um, the doings into the beings and have their doings kind of complement the beings. Because obviously, a life with God shows up in our doing. <laughs> It shows up in the fruit of the Spirit. If the goal of our life is to become followers of Jesus, then really as um, we're to become like him, that is the whole goal. That is the vision. So if that's the case, then shaping of our character does matter more than what we do. So we don't get to the fruit of the Spirit um, by just checking off lists. We get to it by inviting God into our lives, into the abiding into the freedom that we get to experience. And so when I do coach uh, Christian leaders now, and I think that I've probably been coaching for so much longer than I'm actually doing it like now as a profession, but a lot of times people ask these questions like, you know, well, what job should I take? 
what um, should I move to another part of the country? You know, should I do this ministry or that ministry? And I typically say, you know, in, that's all good. Like a lot of times our choices are neutral. Uh, whether we live here or live there, buy this house or that house, do this kind of ministry, that kind of ministry, I feel like those are neutral because there's pros and cons, right, on all of those things. Um, but if the better question to ask would be, okay, what kind of person is God inviting you into? And which job then, which part of the country, which whatever thing it is you're trying to figure out, which of those things is closer and will help you? become more of the person that God is shaping you to be, which is a better laboratory. I feel like motherhood was such a laboratory, marriage for sure, laboratory for growth um, in so many ways because it pushes us, right, through the, through the and stretches us. I think vocational ministry did so much. So I learned so much, and I used to, to joke about um, how I was working at church and they were paying me to grow because I could only minister out of my own um, experience and life with God and whatever richness or poverty there was, that's what the people got. And I think because ministry kind of was like such a um, pressure, kind of a diamond cutting sort of experience in many ways that it, and, and because as long as I was in it, there's just different parts of it. And I love so much of it. And it really did shape my character in ways it never could have. Um, otherwise, I think that, and I stay every year I would ask God, are we, you know, because I, I didn't set out to be a pastor. So every year I would, in my performance evaluation, I'd be like, okay, Lord, are we doing this again for another year? Are we re-upping? Am I still growing? And that was usually the question that Jesus and I talked about. Am I still growing? Am I still learning? Am I still becoming um, shaped more? And is there still more for me here for that? Um, as well as, you know, what's the impact I'm having for the kingdom. Of course, those things matter a lot to the church. And so, of course, we evaluate all that. But for me, it was a personal evaluation of, mm. you know, is this moving me toward the person I want to be? And so I try in my coaching to really help people um, ask those questions. And I recently, last week, actually, I had a, a coaching client, and she's a professional lay, um, and a lay leader at the church. And she was really struggling with, she had three job op options and like, which one, which one, which one? And once I asked, started asking these questions, started unpacking it, she said, I really want to do this one, but I feel like it's, it's not as spiritual as these other ones. And I said, why are we labeling things? Something's spiritual, something's not spiritual. Like move, go towards joy <laughs> and go towards freedom and then ask God, invite God, how, how can I uh, partner with you here? Why do we assume that what God invites us to is the one that's more dreary? <laughs> like, you know, who put that in our heads? I mean, probably Satan, but it's it's not not true. And so I think it's been so fun when you start asking those questions of what is God inviting you into? And if it's more about your character and God caring about your character and the thing that God gets out of our life is our character and the person we become, and that's the person that we have to offer the world that is so much more valuable um, and genuine and worthy than um, our, all of our doings could be. Mm. And I just, I think it's so poignant. And uh, we scheduled this a while back, Ravi, but that we're recording this on Good Friday because it's that the whole question of, are we worthy? Is our doing matter? Like Jesus is like pretty much answered that for all time. Um, and we get to be part of it, part of what he's doing, because he's, but not out of a, a lack or a desire to earn, but really out of, um, the goodness that he's that's chasing after us that we get to be part of it and there's so much more freedom in that and so I have just found on the other side of the mountain to borrow your analogy a life that is so much more full um, and expansive I just feel like God is so much bigger than all the boxes and so um, I love the work I get to do now which is really to help people experience that um, even if they're not Christians, it's so interesting. I also coach non-Christians, but underneath, they're always still asking the question of, you know, do I matter? Does what I do matter? Do I have to earn it for my family? Or if I'm working with a professional um, leader who's male, a lot of times there's a lot of ego stuff around. Who am I if I'm not the VP or I'm not this? People in transition, they're always dealing with who am I if I'm not mm. X? But the better question is, who are? what is the values you want to live into? Um, that's typically how I talk about it with non-believers. Like, what are the values? And they have them. They know what they are. And typically, they're really kind of biblical values. <laughs> 
Um, and once you start unpacking, because all truth is God's truth, and we keep going, back, you know, it goes back to that. And so I get to partner with people in doing that. But man, it's it's a work in progress, Robbie. Like I I was like, dang, here I am again. Am I dealing with this issue again? Um, but I think this is I, I'm receiving more grace and self compassion to go. Okay, Jesus isn't condemning me that I'm going through this loop again. We just kind of remind ourselves again. Remember, Carolyn, we went through this. Remember, we talked about all these things. And remember what I've shown you. And there is so much. I have decades of God's faithfulness Mm -hmm. to uh, reflect and remember and to give me courage uh, when the lies start, like, popping into my head. So, whoo, that was a lot. Okay, so I'll pause there and let you um, unpack what you'd like to. Uh, I want to start by just saying amen. Amen. And um, thanks for sharing. I, I, your so many of us can r- relate to different aspects of your journey that he's had you on, and your clarity, your insight that you can process your own journey is just a catalyst for me as I'm listening. It's like, oh yeah, that you gave words to that thing which a lot of us struggle with at different points. And I, I'll reflect back a couple notes before I ask you a question because I've got some notes and I want to ref- reflect what I heard because I got like four principles out of this at least. Wow. Are um, you like chat GPT, Robbie? How, how do we have to summarize this? Did you just turn that on? <laughs> I, I should probably start using that. That might be... That- <laughs> Might be easier, except void of the spirit. Who knows? Maybe the spirit works through ChatGPT. That's a I I, I prefer your brain. brain. Thank you. <laughs> um, the first thing I, I heard is just your insight and awareness as to the beautiful progress of how transformation, formation, maturity works. And mm-hmm. we're working on a, a, a resource that's coming out in the fall that talks about environments for spiritual growth, mm-hmm. which is like a right view of God, right view of self, and authentic community. That's like the sun, soil, seed. And we're also talking about seasons or the mm-hmm. process of growth. Just like a season for growth of crops, there's seasons you know, of the year. And those seasons you just articulated in, in your story, and this, it's looking back. The four seasons are look back, look up, look in, and look around. So we have to look back at our family of origins because that's where our wrong views of God, self, our lies get implanted. And looking back gives us clarity to then look up at God, who is God and who am I? Um, to to, to re- go, what are the lies to replace with truth, God, based on what has shaped me and the three that you mentioned, you're like, I got the trifecta, family of origin, <laughs> legalistic culture, and the personality for it. So that gives you insights to then what is it, God, to replace those lies with truth? Let's look up. And then look in is, okay, now with Christ in me through a lens of grace, what does becoming mean? Yeah. What, yeah. Is, what is this new understanding and freedom look like in my life experientially that's the that's the looking in that's the becoming piece you were talking about Mm -hmm. and then looking around means okay what is my what is effort is not bad what is my um unique identity gifting calling Mm -hmm. passion and you're in a new season of transition where you Mm -hmm. said i get to do that more for the benefit of others helping them yeah move towards becoming and so those i thought through those seasons of transformation Mm -hmm. that you processed and and that's a continual ongoing thing we're constantly looking back and going oh yeah i thought i was over you even said (laughs) i thought i was over that but once again this is an ongoing thing but how much how much further you are that was the first principle carolyn and amazingly articulated in your own story that's a great summary. <laughs> Thank hey. you for that framework, Robbie. <laughs> Thanks. It, it was, uh, I mean, just how do we help people understand, yeah. you know, the, the progress of growth and yeah. it's, it's, it's circular and progressive in the same part. Yes. Look back, look up, look, right. in, that's look why around. it's the spiral. Yeah. yeah it, it is. That. And the second one is, is your, I was personally encouraged because when you're talking about when you got grace, you're 20 as a mom, how God used 
saving Private Ryan and <laughs> and being a mom to help you ex- like s- have that that paradigm shift, which is like second order change, which is like I see the world differently, I see God differently, myself differently, and I will live differently. That's where like a lot of the the writers will say a a, a second coming, you know, a second awakening, a, a mm-hmm. baptism of the spirit, whatever that is of like, okay, I understand Jesus died on the cross for me, but then where it yeah. moves from the for God to the with God is a paradigm shifting, second order change, everything changes, the lens of which you see the world changes. And that's as I love Jesus, I know Jesus, but now it's fundamentally different. And I've been thinking a lot about that 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 massive thing that God does in some believers' lives, and it seems like some Christians never experience that yeah. awakening or or moving from the first side of the mountain to the second, from the for God to with God. And I've I've had a couple friends recently talk about how they think it's impossible without suffering, or <laughs> um, to experience that. And I agree. Like uh, uh, often there's seasons of suffering because that moves us from pride to humility, from a yeah. for God to with God out of surrender and dependence. So mm-hmm. I understand how it's beautiful how God, like we say, woe, woe are we because of hardship, suffering, brokenness, death, whatever it is of something that we experience grace. But I'm encouraged that I'm, I'm like, some friends were challenging me, you can't get to that without suffering or brokenness. And I'm like, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> now, it might be rare that people understand experience grace without some kind of difficulty as a catalyst for them to surrender into humility. However, your story <laughs> is a testimony of like, through this beautiful awakening of your understanding of his love, through this beautiful experience of the awakening of, of love through being a mom and seeing your daughter. And that was just personally, it's just a praise God. He mm-hmm. can, u- he uses all kinds of things to help us get unstuck and to draw us to paradigm shifts around grace. Yeah. And, and the then, paradigm shift, I think has to be the, the head to the heart, right? Yeah. And I, when I was listening to you talking about the mountain part, I thought that is the difference between people who stay on one side versus people on the other is that we can have the head stuff. It's interesting. My parents, though they were so, um, so devout and so eager and so such servers and they eventually became lay pastors and missionaries and the whole thing, like they would not have, they had the with God life and the for God life together, especially my mother. Like she was not, she did not get hung up like I did. Like Mm. on the outside, it looked like there was all this activity for God. So I interpret it in my, um, you know, in my age and development as, as this. So when I had my paradigm shift, I was really quite judgmental and harsh because I came home and I said, Hey, I don't think you guys are following Jesus properly because you guys are all about the doing. And then they said, no, the doing, our doing is because we are so, so in love with Jesus and so grateful and, and that God's using us. Like in their mind, that didn't hook together. And I think it's so fascinating that people could have the same experiences and because of all the things that make us who we are that, and the other experiences that come along with it and our damage and our brokenness that it hooks differently. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, and they're like, well, we, why do you have this? So my mom was like, why do you have this issue? Like, we never yeah. told you you had to do. I'm like, but I felt like that was a message I got all the time. Yeah. And they're like, maybe academically, but we never said that spiritually. So it's just kind of interesting to recognize the that paradigm shift happens. And you're, I, I do agree with your friends. I think there is an element of suffering that does cause you to think, but it could also be the suffering of being a human being and knowing that this this world is not all there is. And when you're a sensitive person you're, and you're a thinker, like you're going to reach for that deeper level. And that's yeah. what I see with my non-Christian clients. Like there is, there is that calling deeper. There is that hole. And so I think even if you don't suffer, if you're someone who kind of lives life at a deeper level, yeah. y- you are going to be looking for a paradigm that works, that brings freedom. Yes. Yeah, so... I think suffering is a great catalyst because that makes us dependent and 
And I think when I said ministry is um, was a great laboratory for me for my growth is because whenever we stretch ourselves beyond what we can do and beyond what we can control, mm. um, and there's so much in ministry you can't control. You can't make yeah. people say yes to Jesus. <laughs> you can't make people want to be in a small group and grow. Then I think I re- reached the end of my, my own skills pretty quickly. So that caused more of that callus for growth. So, But even in non-Christians, I think... Um, you know, when I work with them or I have non-Christian friends, for people who are thoughtful um, and people who want to live life at a more meaningful level, which there's a lot written nowadays about that. That's why coaching has become so popular mm. and so needed. Um, the workplace, burnout, all the things, um, you know, COVID. It, so I think regardless, even if it's not suffering, I think if you want to live life in a more meaningful level, you're going to have to confront which side of the mountain you're on and which yeah. paradigm you're living through. Because that first paradigm of the the earning, the trying, 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 just um, at some point is just becomes too exhausting and unsustainable. Yeah. And then we read about peace and the light yoke and we're like, (laughs) I do not know that. Uh, Yes. Oh, and in fact, okay, so I have to mention the light yoke thing because this is uh, my spiritual director. One time I remember talking about, I have to do this thing in ministry. And it was like we were going through a Catholic campaign or something. And there was just a lot going on. And you've had those seasons too, right? And I think I was just whining. I was whining a bit. Um, And then she said to me, she said, you know, Jesus says his burden is, yoke is easy and his burden is light. So perhaps if you're finding the yoke heavy and the burden heavy and difficult, um, perhaps you're not carrying it the way you you need to be carrying it, which is basically a call back to with God versus for God. Story of my life. And, and even, and even now, and it goes, uh, I mean, just in the, the alignment of the saving private Ryan thing and how that emotionally hit me, that hits at my primary shame story of, um, getting to the end and going, I could have, should have stewarded what you gave me more, God, which is a, I'm carrying it. And he's going, Ravi, <laughs> Ravi, Ravi, I love you. But I mean, I just still go back to it, which I wrote down here was another principle that I, I heard in you of just the, the grace that you give yourself and others and, and that we should remind each other of, of mm-hmm. even on the right side of the mountain, or after you get this awakening to grace and this paradigm shift from control to peace, from head to heart, from doing to being, which is really moving from control to trusting God, who he is, yes. what he did, then it's still progressive. It's this beautiful, yeah. progressive thing that I still wake up more comfortable. I would rather be in control than trust. And that speaks to the <laughs> burden, the lightness you know, uh, the light yoke. And it's just, it's just, it keeps me in control when I put it on my shoulders and carry it the way I want to, instead of come under his yoke and trust him with it. And, and that is, that is the beautiful process of, instead of like, oh crap, I'm, you know, Carolyn, you're 25 years into this, like (laughs) understanding why are you still going back to it? It's like, oh yeah, even that is a gift of his grace that you get to remember uh, the and and receive and trust all over again every day, and that we don't just get it because even if we just got it and didn't need to remember to trust him every day and receive his grace anew, we would then miss out on his love in new ways every yeah. day. It's true, and the gratitude then follows that, right? So mm-hmm. one of the verses I memorized early on, knowing that this was my tendency, was that you know there's therefore no condemnation in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have used that for so much to uh, with others because so many of us are caught up in that web. And that's the beauty of community, right? Because we can say to each other when we're beating ourselves up, like, oh, here I am again. And it'd be like, but you're not where you were, yeah. right? Yep. And that's part of kind of what I get to do now with people. And I used to do a lot in discipling people when people would be like, oh, now I'm struggling with this. Be like, but you're not where you are. So we pay attention. I think a big beauty, the, the most, one of the most powerful things we can do in community for one another is to um, hold space and to remember for each other when we can't remember for ourselves. Because mm-hmm. we're like so tunnel vision to here's what I'm not yet, yeah. especially if you're wired like, you know, achievers and you know, you're used to like doing these types of things. You're kind of like, I, I here's, I'm so cognizant of all my weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and so to have somebody come along and say, but here's all the other stuff 
that God's already done through you. You know, there's an encouragement exercise that I would um, always had small groups do about week six or so after they've been meeting for about six times, five, six times. And they would just write on pieces of paper um, what they've seen, how the person in the group has encouraged them. Um, and it's almost always a such a meaningful, emotional, and freeing and encouraging experience because people can't see themselves clearly. We are not um, good self-narrators. Mm -hmm. And so when someone else says, I've seen how you've encouraged me as X, and they're like, really? Like, that just, that's the encourage one another. That, that, that's the biggest um, way I think we support because the encouragement then gives us oxygen to keep going. It gives us, you know, that um, the motivation and inspiration that, oh, I am, there is movement. Movement begets movement. Yep. It, we, we get stuck when we think there is no movement. So we can do that for one another in community to say, I see Christ in you. Here's what I've seen. Here's how it's blessed me. Like that is just more than a million sermons. Like an evening, evening like that experientially. And I know True Face, I love how there's such an emphasis on things being experiential, not just head knowledge. Um, and that's why, like, The Cure, I mean, you, you just almost experience, it's a book, but you almost experience it because of the way in which it's told. You, you enter into the narrative like that. Yeah. So it becomes that. And I think the, the beauty of community, and there's so many wonderful things about community, but the power of affirming for one another the progress that we see when we can't see for ourselves, like, that is only something that one can do for one another in Christian community and relationships. Amen. So, yes, yeah, so now I sound like a small groups pastor all over again. Come on, come on. Uh, the, it, what you're, you know, this process of formation, you know, the, the first principle note, the, the seasons of growth, mm -hmm. look back, look up, look in, look around. The second thing is this paradigm shift, second order change of grace. Uh, just how God uses that sometimes through suffering, mm -hmm. sometimes through others, and how that takes time. And is progressive, yes. the third principle of like the progressive order of even that gift of still you and I going, oh, yeah, it's easier every day and we get his graces <laughs> anew every day. And the fourth principle I wrote back, you just alluded to that you articulate how you work with your clients of becoming um, and moving into like and even as believers, you are becoming more like Christ. And that the fruit of that spirit, Christ in you, is more love, more joy, peace, patience, mm -hmm. kindness, yes. goodness, gentleness, self control. That is a centered set approach. Um, the the second mm -hmm. half, uh, the the f I'm thinking out loud here. Really, on the formation journey, it feels like the first the the first half um, of religion is more of a bounded set of like. Sin yes. less, no more, do better. Like this makes yes. you what you are. And the becoming is such a centered set um, visual of become mm -hmm. becoming more of who you already are with Christ mm -hmm. in you, which looks like love. And you and I are moving, hopefully, as we grow. And you mentioned that you said, hey, I'll do check-ins and go, am I becoming more loving and peaceful and yes. joyful? And that is... That is, that is maturity. That's growth. That's what we get to do. We, and that is more centered set, which is freeing. It's harder though, Robbie. Oh, Don't yeah. you think that's why it's, 100%. it's, um, the, you know, the boundaries set, you stay in control. Yeah. You know, what gets the points, uh, you know, what is deemed righteous, yep. the center is set. There's all kinds of freedom, which is all kinds of scary too. <laughs> and it's messy. Yeah. If you sit with people and they're trying doing this journey and they haven't quite gotten there and they're trying to figure it out. It's, it's quite messy oh, yeah. um, and requires a lot of empathy, a lot of compassion to, to be with people through it and to be with ourselves through it. Yeah. So I think the attraction of why the, this is why the Pharisees just kept going back to it, right? Cause it's, it's def, the definition, the boundary thing, it just is cleaner and clearer. And we like that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, those of us who like control really like that. I think the center set, though, is always the invitation. Yeah. And it's freer because I don't have to make anybody change. I don't have to make um, anybody follow any, you know, follow Jesus. It's, it's more, it's just the constant invitation of um, God, be with me in this. Yeah. 
So back to my client with the job thing, like any of these options, you invite God into it and he's going to work. It's going to be amazing. Um, and your character will be shaped a little differently. Job A might shape it a little differently than job B or job C, but you can't miss when God's in it. There's an interconnectivity of, I, I wonder the question we can ask each other as we land the plane on this podcast or, or those of us listening, I, I wonder the question we can uh, bring to God because there is a, a chicken egg deal with trusting God and love. Like <laughs> if I, um, like if I look at my life, where do I not feel love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, mm -hmm. goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control where I don't feel that there is a, it, one of those things will stand out to me right now for you today, Carolyn, I could ask you and you could ask me, where do you not feel mm -hmm. those things as a centered set becoming, and those are indicators and gifts again to go, Hey, here's mm -hmm. an opportunity to trust more deeply yeah. to experience, um, and become more fully the, um, because if it is, you know, I don't feel patient I f and because of a yoke of a project and pressure I'm feeling, and therefore I'm not feeling peace uh, because this <laughs> thing, there's a trust question. Of, yeah. So it's two questions. Where am I not feeling one of those aspects of the fruit of the spirit? And therefore, what does that indicate a something that I don't trust? I don't trust that God will um, help me get through it, or I'm going to fail and this will be, I will be seen as a failure. It, there's a trust statement behind uh, the, the struggle or the tension. Um, and sometimes it's, God, I don't trust you with this thing. And mm -hmm. therefore, where does this all show up in those things? But I think it's that way. So as you're listening to this, my hope is that we get to go to our father and say, uh, or introspection or go to a friend, like Carolyn said, the beauty of objectivity, we're not meant to do this alone. And therefore someone who knows us lately to say, Hey, fruit of the spirit in Galatians, which one of these do I not, do you see me, uh, a little off on? They would say, Robbie, I don't see you as uh, very peaceful right now. So then the question is, God, what, what, do, what do you hope me, what lie do you hope for me to replace with the truth of, I don't trust you with this, God, or I don't trust that um, you'll have me or that you'll help us or that I can or whatever that is. And then that truth telling of what I don't trust yeah. helps us then receive from him the truth of, and turn to that truth and receive yeah. it. So that, but, uh, yeah. And then. I think the third, if I, the third step, I, I love that, that framework. So the third step I think would be once we identify what lie that is, that's holding us hostage from the truth. Once we identify it and receive the truth, then I think we can look around and, and look at our life and different laboratories. We have different opportunities. We have to grow that muscle yeah. and go, if, if it's something around money, then maybe we have to actually do something experiential. That's, um, that speaks into that truth that lives into it. I think without living into it, it stays yeah. in our head. Yeah. So if it's about money, then maybe that's about generosity. If yeah. it's about shame, maybe it's something we need to disclose to a trusted person. I, I don't, it depends what it is, but I think, you know, whichever one it is. And this is interesting um, for one of the classes I was teaching on um, emotional intelligence, because I recognize that Jesus had the highest emotional intelligence of anyone ever in the world in all time. And when you start looking at high EQ uh, qualities, they pretty much look like the further spirit and they look like, um, someone who's spiritually mature. I, I was flabbergasted by putting them two together and I was like, wow, they look, so then I created, um, and people are welcome to just go on my website and just email me, but created, created a, a, um, graph that I call through the spirit wheel huh. and I have all the fruit of spirit on there. And then you can actually rate yourself and figure out where the balance is. And then you can give it, if you are really wanting to grow, you can give it to your spouse, you can give it to your kids and then go, okay, where, where am I on this? Let's and not go. to, not to scold yourself or feel bad, but just to go, Hey, where's the, the, the edge? Where's the edge of growth for me? And don't try to tackle all nine of them at once. Pick one. Yeah find an activity that addresses that one bite size. It's all about bite size. Yeah. And then I think once you do kind of ask the question, as you said, Robbie, and then unveil the truth, 
kick out the lie and then do an activity that lives into that truth. And you, then you rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And then it actually starts to change our thinking and then our paradigm shifts. And then we get to live into that for other people as well. I love it. Well, <laughs> Carolyn, this was so fun. You're coming back. And you, you said <laughs> at the beginning of this, you wanted to be part of the tribe. There, we're centered set. You're in. You're in. No boundaries. So, I love that. Thank you for the welcome. Do I? I I'd like to get my official letter. Nope. See, I'm nope. very official. Nothing official. No <laughs> membership here. No bounded set uh, <laughs> things required. You're in, and I have appreciated I love that. our time together and excited oh, thank you. about this next one. Carolyn, bless you, and thank you for bless being you. a friend and a part of this True Face tribe. <laughs> I'm excited and thrilled to be part of this tribe, Robbie. Thank you for um, the opportunity. And anytime, I, I just think what you're doing and what True Face is doing is so, so needed in the kingdom. And I'm just so impressed at, at how you guys are going about it. So I love to be part of that. You are awesome. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> okay.